So I'm going to talk about uh, establishing and building rapport in final expense telesales, why that's important, and how do you do it? And, and what does it really mean? So let's just get right into it. Uh, what is rapport and why it is important and why is it important? So I'm going to look up the definition of rapport actually right here. And I'm pretty, I've like, I know it, but it's a close and harmonious relationship in which the people or groups connected understand each other's feelings or ideas and communicate well. So a close and harmonious relationship. Okay. Close and harmonious means like it's flowing and it's steady in which the people or groups connected, so in this case, you and your, your client understand each other's feelings or ideas and communicate well. So you have to understand their ideas first. You have to give before you can get. So you have to understand their feelings and their ideas before they're gonna understand your feelings or your ideas. They have to know you care before they care about what you know, okay? So it, this really is getting on common ground with the client and it really starts right in the beginning. You know that when you call them, they are going to be scared and they're going to be anxious and they're not going to want to talk to you because they think you're just another insurance agent trying to sell them something, which you are. <laughs> but how do you do that right in the beginning? You address their fears. They're, they have fears that they are going to be pressured into doing this. They have fears that they're going to have to have to buy and, and make a decision they're going to regret. Maybe they don't think they'll qualify. Maybe they don't think they can afford it. Maybe they don't want to give you the time of day because they're just scared to talk to people. Maybe they got scammed before. Maybe they think you're going to scam them. Whatever it is, they don't trust you. So you have to address those fears when you get that pushback. And you can pretty much say the same thing to everybody who gives you that pushback in the beginning. Hey, no worries. Look, it's my job to get you this information in the shortest amount of time possible. So you can make a decision whenever you're ready. You don't have to do anything today. And then, and then you just keep moving. You ask a question and keep moving on. So you're really addressing the fears right there, right? Hey, is this going to take me too much time? My job is to get you information in the shortest amount of time possible. So you can make a decision whenever you're ready. You don't have to do anything today. So I'm just getting you information. It's harmless. You really don't have to do anything today. And it's true. They don't have to do anything today, but we will go for the close. So what we're really doing right there in the beginning is you're establishing that common ground and you're establishing that rapport right from the beginning. Now, the purpose of this is to start to start with building a foundation of trust, okay? Because the client has to trust you and feel comfortable with talking to you right in the beginning. Also, you want to have a good tonality in the beginning. Um, some people, it works better if they just kind of take a, a more, I guess, monotone and natural tone. Um, I'm naturally enthusiastic and excited, like all the time. <laughs> so I take a naturally enthusiastic tone when I'm talking to people because that's just how I am. When you when you talk to someone, uh, you, you, the first thing you want to build that foundation of trust. The purpose isn't to sell them right away. It's like I am just I'm just connecting with you here, common ground. It makes the sale easier and it builds the prospect certainty on you. So they start start try they start seeing you as someone that okay, my certainty on this person is increasing a little bit, and establishing rapport throughout the conversation helps you get those tough answers at the end. Like when you get their bank account information and their social security information. And it also helps them open up to you about other things in their life uh, that, that over time are going to, are going to help you. Uh, I, I mean that, that are going to help build a relationship, personal things. So actually, if you look up right here, um, I have a video I'm not that. If you find value in this video, please subscribe to my channel, like the video, and also throw a comment in there. You can always email me at jve at thejve.com. If you would like a template of questions to build rapport off of, uh, to use to build rapport, then please email me and I will send that over to you. Just have to email me a screenshot that you subscribe to my channel and turned on post notifications and I will send you the template for how to build rapport and establish a relationship with your clients. So. Uh, number one, uh, tonality is important in establishing rapport throughout the rest of the presentation. So I am a firm believer that if you are enthusiastic in your tone, that people are going to be sold on what you do and they're going to be, because they know that you're sold on what you do. Um, and you're passionate about it. And people defer to people who are enthusiastic and passionate and it displays confidence. They will defer to you as a professional. Being enthusiastic and excited about what you're talking about establishes rapport by communicating that what you're offering has value, okay? Um, you don't have to be like crackhead crazy about what you do, but just be like excited to be alive. Okay, because no one wants to talk to someone who's grouchy or sad or angry. Next conversation. So talking to the client about things that are important to them outside of insurance like where they live, their family, their hobbies, stuff like that. That's really important. I love this. Now I go into a phone call 
And, and when I go into a sales call and when I jump on a sales call for an agent, cause I, I really don't make many calls out myself anymore or take any transfers coming in. I call, I, I help people with their sales now. So when, when I do that, um, I, I go in and I say, how can I give this person a good experience? How can I make this person happy? How can I make their day? And how can I make them smile at the end of this call? My goal is to make someone happy and make them smile and have a positive impact on their life. So talking to them about things like where they live, where they grew up, their family, their, their marriage, their children, their grandchildren, other, other family members, their hobbies, okay? Um, maybe what they did for work, what they do for work. Relating to them, sharing something about me, showing true interest in what they're talking about, and then having a little conversations about that while weaving in questions that are important to the sale. I found that that is a really good way to get people to like me. And I've, I've had many sales where at the end of the sale, they say, you know what, I've, I've had so many people call me. You're, you're the first person to actually like take the time to just talk to me um, and not just try to like slam a policy down, down, my, down my throat. Um, that's not the exact verbiage, but that's essentially what they were communicating. I, uh, I, I truly believe that you can help people have a good day with this. We talk to people that are, some of them are depressed. They're probably watching the news all day. That's not too exciting. And, and you can go in and have someone, like go into a conversation with the point of cheering someone up. So tonality is a great way to, to establish rapport. Conversation is a great way to establish rapport. Because if they start sharing all this stuff about their personal life with you, it's not really like a big deal for them to share their, their other stuff, like bank information and social. Like it's not as big of a deal. Because they're like, I've just told this person my life story. Like whatever, I trust them. They're good. They're a good person. They have to know you and like you. And then, as someone communicates with you, and as someone shares these things, there it's absolutely impossible for someone not to trust you more as they talk to you and get to know you as you get to know them. It is impossible. It's it's never going to happen where someone won't have more trust towards you as you get to know them and talk to them. Now, they still may not have enough trust to be certain on buying the policy at the end because, hey, they may have been treated poorly in the past or whatever. They have these other or, you know, preconceived notions in their head. But it's impossible to have a conversation with someone and have them not like you more. So make sure your client is doing talking, is doing some of the talking, most of the talking. You want your client to be doing like 60% of the talking in this and you doing like 40% or like 65-35. Now, another thing that builds rapport is expertise. So when you're an expert in your field, people are going to defer to you. It's like whenever anybody goes to the doctor, they're like best doctor in this area. Who's the best? Who's the best? Who knows the most? Who has the most knowledge? Most knowledge? Who's the biggest expert? Attorneys, uh, doctors, like really anything. Plumber. Who's the best plumber? Who's the best carpenter? Right? Like we are looking for the best, meaning they have the most knowledge. They have the most applied knowledge. They know the most. They are applying the most valuable pieces of data every day. So when you, do, when you express an expertise on the products you're selling, your competitors' products, and how these products work, then you come across as an expert in your field, and people defer to experts. There's so many people who don't even question the pills that their doctors prescribe them, okay? And it's because the doctor's considered an, an expert, okay? So now, how do you do this? How do, how do you kind of weave this into your presentation? So there are some questions here I'm going to go over. This is how you do it. And then at the end of this, I'm going to be playing a call where I actually ask some of these questions to build an established rapport with a client. So um, I say, hey, Georgia is a beautiful, say they're in Georgia. I say, hey, Georgia is a beautiful part of the country. How, how long you live there for? Oh, I've been there, been there 20 years. Oh, that's so cool. You know, I actually grew up, I spent 20 something years in Massachusetts and then I moved down to Florida. Definitely a transplant here. I know that some of the locals frown upon that, but uh, cool, man. So what brought you to Georgia? Or, or um, what was your favorite part about growing up in Georgia? If they say they grew up in Georgia. Uh, or like that person said, I've been in Georgia 20 years. Oh, where'd you live before? What brought you there? And they say, oh, you know, I was in the military and I did this. Hey, thank you so much for your service. That's awesome. You know, my grandfather was in the military. Both my grandfathers were in the military, actually. What branch were you in? And then so like you can, when someone, when you ask a question, about this stuff. You want to reply with empathy, praise, or hope. So they, you reply with empathy, which is, I can feel what you're feeling. I relate to what you're feeling. Um, praise, which is, wow, that's awesome. Or hope, like, hey, there's a, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Like, th things are looking up for you. Everything's going to be okay. So you want to reply to whatever they say with that. Okay, because if you're like, hey, they're like, I moved to Georgia, and you're like, why? And they're like, well, because my uh, my parents died and I was orphaned there. They're like, oh my gosh, well, I'm, 
like, thank you for sharing that with me. I, I can imagine that was a probably a challenging time in your life. I can't imagine if, if I had to go through that, but like, look how far you've come. That's incredible. And like the future is so bright for you. I can, I can, I just know everything's going to be, going to be good. Like if it happened right away, like that's kind of s- how you'd, you'd, you'd base it. Every conversation is going to be a little different, but you want to reply with empathy, praise or hope. W- what do you like to do for fun? If I go to Georgia one day, what do you, what do you recommend I do? Oh, well, I don't know. I used to go fishing down by this river. Oh my God. I love fishing. Now, did you, what type of uh, reels do you use, you know, spinner, spin cast or bait cast or did you like to use live bait or lures? Like you can go into these questions and build a conversation and then share stories about yourself that you can truly like relate. And now it doesn't have to be about you, right? Like if you weren't a fisherman or a fisher woman, I guess. You can say, oh, well, you know, my dad loved fishing. My dad was a fisherman. He went out all the time and did this, 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 or my grandfather did. My grandfather had all these fish mounted in his house and this and that. Do you have any fish mounted in your house? So you can just build off of these questions, okay? Um, hey, now let me ask you this. Are you still working? You retired? Or are you, are you, are you living the dream? And they'll tell you, oh, I'm, I'm doing this. This is, I, I, I'm retired. Wow, that's awesome. How long you work for? And about 45 years. Like, Geez, I can't find people to work for 45 minutes. Never mind 45 years. You know, definitely a d- despair, a change in a, 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 the generations before who used to work at one thing for a long time. And now people just kind of give up without even trying. And then, you know, you relate to them and commend them, praise them. Oh, my God, you, live, you worked this long. If they're like, oh, I was a stay-at-home mom. I didn't, I didn't work. Like, well, you had the most important job of all. You raised the family. Right. And then that opens up to talk, ask about the kids. And then you can always say, hey, um, are you married? Are you divorced or single? And then they can tell you. And if they're like, oh, I'm married. How long have you been married for? Like I said, if they're like, I'm divorced. Be, they're like, I'm divorced. You say, oh, I, I knew you were unusually happy for a reason. And uh, then you, you, you know, you, you, whatever, you say a joke on it. And uh, this is a big part that most people leave out. Uh, really out of their presentations because what happens is um, I, I, they're, they're asking their clients everything about insurance and, and like these things that they're going to share with you about their family and, and where they live and their life and the people that are important to them. That's really what this policy is protecting, right? Because if, if, the, if they didn't have those people in their life, they probably wouldn't really care as much about a life insurance policy because th- there would be no one, there'd be no pain point, right? They wouldn't be like, oh, well, I don't know. Someone's going to get it. Like, so, so you want to talk about those people. Also, ask them about their grandkids. Ask them if they have kids and grandkids. So you got any children? Oh, what do they do for work? So I would ask, what do they do for work? Because they'll tell you how many they have in their names right there. You can start writing them down. Rather than how many do you have? What are their names? What do they do for work? If you just ask, what do they do for work? Um, they're more likely to list them out and then tell you what they do. And then that gives you some more ammunition to go out further into a conversation with. So, you know, I've always done this kind of naturally when I talk to people and I didn't realize what I was doing and that I was establishing rapport with people all the time and building a relationship with them. But it's getting to know what's important to people. And look, at if any of you want to be an agency builder at some point, then you're going to have to learn this stuff right now. If you look up right here, what you're going to see is a video on how I cover every single objection in final expense telesales. Watch me cover every objection in final expense telesales. And when you build this rapport, it's going to make it easy, easier to handle any objections that come up and go for the close because people are going to be more likely to trust you. You're going to run into less objections. You're still going to get objections and you're still going to have people you don't sell, but it's going to really, really help you. And it increases your talk, your activity, because what I found, you can spend X amount of time Say if you, now this is, there are agents who are an exception to this. There's some people who can connect with people in just a couple minutes and close the sale in 10 to 15 minutes. We have plenty of those agents, but for the most part, that's not duplicatable. So what's duplicatable is having a solid conversation, a good presentation, 25 to 30 minutes, and then going for the close. Because what happens is most people, if they try to close in the first 10 to 15 minutes, then they're going to spend another 20 minutes in the close, like begging the person, chances are that the good chance they're going to hang up. Whether it, whereas if you take that time to present and then talk to them for that amount of time, then the close comes and you usually don't spend as much time in the close. It also depends what leads you're working. Like if you get like super hot inbound calls, you don't really need to build as much rapport. You really don't. Like if you're getting TV leads or inbound calls from social media or even like, like live transfers from like an ad online that was just filled out, 
you don't really have to build as much rapport. It's not as important. Um, th th it's more of a transaction. But when you're doing outbound calls to leads that may have been generated in the last week or, or if they're age leads, it's super important to establish this relationship because they don't really know who you are. Like you called them. They may not even remember doing it. If you have an inbound call where someone just filled out a form online and it's a live transfer from that or they're calling in directly, then... Um, then, then, then you, you don't have to build. You, it's an easier sale. It's a much easier sale. It doesn't take as much skill to close that, but it costs it costs more money for the lead. Um, so you know, obviously, if you have marketing costs, that's ideal, right? The faster you can close the sale, that's ideal. But a lot of people they have trouble affording live transfers or TV leads and stuff like that right when they start. So if you are buying a ton of age leads, then you can dial with that. If uh, I have a great source for age leads, you can reach out to me. Um, compliant, just reach out to me. I can I can hook you up with this person. They have they have re really really good age leads. You can get a good deal on them, like a doll or something each. So uh, let me know about that. Um, but this is this is the most important for me, the most important part of the presentation that I see a lot of agents skip over and they don't try to make a personal connection with their client. So moving forward, I, I would what I'd like recommend everybody to do here is build a connection with your clients through these things that I just covered here. Like I said, if you want a template on how to do this, you can reach out to me, I'll email it to you. And then also uh, stay tuned right now, I'm going to be playing um, a live call of me building rapport with a client. Thanks, thank you guys. Okay, we're gonna listen to this call by Peter Penwarden. It's not gonna be me. Peter, one of my agents, he does an awesome job of overcoming objections and building rapport like right from the beginning. Hello, what do you need? <laughs> Straight to business, huh? <laughs> well, you had reached uh, at our company's website requesting some information on our final expense programs. Just trying to get the back, get back to you on that. Well, I, so far I'm not happy with any of the quotes, you know. So, so notice that he maintained an enthusiastic, excited tone. He laughed. He chuckled. And then he kind of played like nonchalant. Yeah, I'm getting getting back to you to get you some some information. Uh huh. What uh, have you been quoted so? Far? Have you talked to like an agent like me? Because I work with I'm a broker, right? So I work with like 15 of the best companies in Tennessee, and I kind of do the shopping around for you. Well, most of them want to spend half an hour on the phone asking stupid questions, and <laughs> and uh, that pisses me off. So uh, <laughs> I hear I hear that I hear yeah. that. Well, we can make this as quick as you'd like. Who would you want to be your beneficiary? Who would you want the money going to? I don't know yet. You could do your estate, and that's basically just your name. And then if you ever if that ever changes, just give me a call and I switch it for you. But we could do your estate for now. Do you have any life insurance or you've just been shopping around? I had some, and it played out at a certain age. So uh... They, like, increased on you? Okay, cool. So what Peter did is he went right in, level with the client. Peter's been doing this a while, so like most new agents, it would be hard for them to pivot like that, right? Most new agents are going to be following a script and sticking to it. But he was enthusiastic in the beginning. He kind of dropped it down a little bit to kind of level with her because of her kind of aggression, right? She wasn't aggressive, but she was definitely on guard, a little more guarded than normal. So he dropped it down a little bit. Now we're going to fast forward a little bit further ahead so you can hear him build rapport and how he shares stories with the client about anything. So you want to share stories with the client <clears throat> when they talk to you about certain things to show that you can relate or like share their values and morals and things like that. So we're going to find this. Okay. It's A-T-O-R-V-A-S-T-A-T-I-N. What in the hell is that? It's just a Torvastatin. Uh, I can give you like the Google thing, but uh, it's it's for a couple things. One of them I think is cholesterol. Yeah, high cholesterol, and then it says this may reduce the risk of angina, stroke, heart attack, and heart and blood vessel problems. Well, so. he kind he kind of liked me. He said, you know, I said, what <laughs> the hell? I said, what the hell about getting rid of this? He said, well. I just rather you'd stay on it, and then it's just an extra guarantee, you you know, you ain't going to yeah. have no problems. Yeah, it's better to be, you know, cautious when it comes to things, and because you can always, like, uh, uh, it's my dad used to tell me, like, in hot weather, and it, it's kind of applicable, uh, like, you can always take it off, you know, you, you can't always add on. Well, so that's what like, I say. Yeah, exactly, so <laughs> that's, um, 
might as well have. Just take it for preventative. So right there, he was relating to a story about what he had done in his life, advice that he got from his dad to make the client feel okay about the medication she was taking. So he was able to, if we go back to the definition of rapport again, right, which is exactly a close and harmonious relationship in which the people or groups concerned understand each other's feelings or ideas and communicate well. So he understood her feelings and her ideas and he communicated well about her being on her medication, okay? And so he built a little rapport right there. You know, measures so you're not running into any of those problems again because it seems you're sharp as a tech. Oh, hell yeah. I, I got a, a 88-year-old mother with dementia and a, a hmm. 100-year-old stepfather that I go babysit every other day, and then I dance two nights a week and still mow my yard. I still do everything I'm doing. Ain't nothing a damn thing wrong with me. Hell yeah. My, um, my grandmother had dementia. So right there, right? Normally you wouldn't want to curse with a client on the phone, but that lady was definitely cursing. So he had permission there to do it, okay? So he related to her in that sense. He's matching her like, she's like, ah, da, da, da. she was cursing, he's going to curse. And she was like, she's been throwing him out the whole call. So it was okay for him to do it in that situation too. And like it was really bad. Like I would talk to her and she would think I was someone else because when I talked to her, I was like, you know what I am now. It was a couple of years ago, so I was like 18, and she didn't. She doesn't remember me for when I was like 12 years old or 11 or whatever she's in in that train of thought. So whenever I would talk to her when we had her on hospice, she would literally like, she would just like pretend I'm someone else. Well, she didn't pretend. She really thought she I was like. Didn't know. She yeah, just didn't know. Exactly, and and you, if you know anything about that, you're not supposed to like. You're not to, you. You just play along with it. You oh know, yeah, because that, it just you makes know. them mad, and then they get all like yeah. riled up, and you just no. Don't mama, do that. mama don't care on a conversation. She'll just look at me and smile, and and uh, she said she'll say you got more sense than the rest of them. I said I know, mama. <laughs> she said you're pretty. I said I know, mama. You know, uh -huh. and that, that's about all she says. She just looks at me. My mother's redheaded, and. Uh, Mm -hmm. I just had her hair dyed last day or two, and the beautician over her, so, but it's it's bad. What age did your grandmother die of? It was young. She was like 50. So see here, he is taking something that she said, a tough situation. He's giving an example of how he's been through the same thing, and he's talking with her about it, and he's developing a relationship. You notice he's keeping it about her. Now, at this point, they're over 10 minutes into the call. I've skipped ahead. At first, this lady was like, everybody's asking me these dumb questions. Do -do -do -do. But look at, she appreciates this conversation. She doesn't seem that way anymore. So he has completely flipped this conversation around to where she was standoffish. Now she's telling him her life story. And he did that by relating to her, by acknowledging what she's saying, replying with empathy, praise, or hope, sharing a story about himself, and then asking another question. That's the formula for rapport building, guys. Ask a question, you reply with empathy, praise, or hope to the answer, you make a comparison about your life, and then you ask another question. And you can weave this in and out of your fact-finding in your presentation, in your entire presentation. You can weave this in and out of it. In her 50s. Oh, oh, she was a diabetic, alcoholic. Oh, her, yeah. Saw her son die when he was 18. Shot in the face. Yeah. So she yeah. used that as an excuse to drink. Yeah. Yeah, she kind of gave up on my mom. Yeah. Yeah. But I my mom's one hell of a trooper, though. She she had a baby at 17, put herself through nursing school, still working till this day, working night shifts. She's probably working right now. Well, that's what keeps people going. It's this bullshit between me and you, boy. Retiring and setting back, they die young. You just got you got to keep going. If mm -hmm. you ain't if you ain't got a job, you got hell. I I used to be in the record business. And I owned a body shop and a record service. Oh wow! And I used to run seven days a week, twenty four hours a day. Sometimes on two and three hours sleep. And yeah. uh, and then I'd go open the shop up at eight o'clock. I mean at seven o'clock. And then hell, sometime I didn't come home. And then when I pulled in the driveway. In the wrecker, I was back up working all night sometimes. I worked two years without a day off. So 
So I know how to work, but the worst thing that people can do, to be honest with you, is retire. Yeah. You know, my um, I went through a bad breakup of like three years and, and I was talking to my boss and I was like, ah, I just can't work today. Like, it's just like, uh, you know how you just want to lay down. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. I felt like just terrible. I wanted to lay down. He just told me this one thing that stuck with my head ever since. He said, uh, the idle mind is the devil's playground. He's exactly like, right. You, wow. You're, just, you're looking for an excuse to throw your hands up and quit and you can't do that, you know. You know, it, you've got to have enough sense to pull your head out of your ass and move on, boy. I mean, yeah. you ain't the only ones ever had somebody to leave in. You won't be the last one. So you just got to learn to pull your drawers up and move on. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that gave me a So right here, guys, this is a perfect example of how to build rapport. And Peter did an incredible job of it. He continued it through this entire conversation. But I wanted to show you the examples of how he did it in the beginning of the call and then how he did it towards the, throughout the development of the presentation. So I hope you guys learned something from this. When you're talking to your clients, take time to get to know them. I'm telling you, if you can take the time to get to know them in the presentation, it's going to save you time trying to get push and move to a policy in the end. This woman, he closed the sale. This was the easiest laydown sale ever. The woman was like, I got my checkbook ready for you whenever you need it. Like, it was the easiest thing because he took time to talk to this woman. I guarantee you, she did not talk to any agent like him. So... Great job on this, Peter. I hope you guys learned something from this.